Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Ellie, and I'm an alcoholic. Early in this meeting, Bob had asked, are there any newcomers? And I'd like to welcome those who are new to this group or new to AA. I hope that you'll be able to take away something from this meeting that will be able to keep you through one more day without a drink. Um, Not necessarily did my first meeting start out that way. I like to ask, though, at this time, is there any, how many people here, and if you'd just, just raise your hand to have a year and less of sobriety. Those people I'd like to give a hand to. It's those newcomers, the new people that are lifeblood of AA. You people are the ones who keep us, keep coming back. You know, it's not only just the ones that have been here for a while or for two or three meetings or for five, ten, fifteen years, but it's the new people that come in. It is a constant reminder to me of what it can happen if I should choose to go back out and drink again. And it uh, reminds me about a, this couple. I'll tell you a joke, then I'll relax. This couple had a baby, and the poor thing was really quite a sad sight. It was just a head. No body, no nothing, just a head. So they raised this poor infant until it got to be up in years. And when it was 21 years old, the father one day picked up the little head and started walking towards the door. And the mother says, my God, where are you going? And he says, well, my son is 21, and I'm going to buy him his first beer. So she said, all right. So out the door he went and down, went down to the local tavern and sent the head right there on a bar stool next to him. And bartender took a look at it, and I might tell you, preface this by saying I used to be a bartender, and I've seen a lot of things, but I've not just seen a head. So I have this head sitting on this bar stool next to the father, and the, and the, the guy says, give me two beers. The bartender says, okay. So he sits down two beers, and the father picks up one beer, and the head opens up his mouth, and pours the beer down, and my God, all of a sudden an arm sprung out. He says, God, hurry up, give me another beer. So I got another beer and poured it down the head, and another arm sprung out. He says, quick, another beer. Got him another beer and poured it down, and a leg sprung out. The bartender grabbed another beer and gave it to the guy and poured it down the head, and another arm, another leg sprung out. The guy is sitting there, and the head's sitting there. It's got arms and legs all over the place, you know, and everything, and everyone's happy. And all of a sudden, the guy just, you know, the head just peeled over and fell down on the floor. The bartender looked down and says, well... Should have quit while he was ahead. <laughs> now, that's kind of like my drinking went. I sure as hell should have quit while I was ahead. But uh, needless to say, I didn't. That's why I'm here. And that's why I have people like you. I... um. I didn't all of a sudden wake up one day and say, wow, I think I'll be an alcoholic. <laughs> Woo, haven't got anything else to do today, so I think I'll be an alcoholic. I, um, I came from a, from a family that, um, well, give you an idea, well, we're Irish and German. And if, uh, if you can't talk to death and can't drink to death and can't screw to death, you don't want it, you know. So that's kind of the way my family went. You sat a fist down in the middle of the table, you ran and raised, screamed and shout, drank the fist, got up, kissed each other, and went out the door. And that's the way my father, my uncle, my grandfather, and all of our relatives seemed to handle every occasion that ever came into our house. My parents were hardworking people. We owned a family business, and everybody worked. And uh, there were two girls, and my father wanted a boy, and I was his boy. Dressed me in bib overalls and a, and a hat, a little ball cap, and away I went from the age, from the beginning until, and all the time he used to say, this is my boy, isn't she cute, this is my boy, and I never really, really knew what it meant to be a girl. 
I never had dolls. I never had, you know, dressed up in frilly dresses. I always had on blue overalls and uh, and rode horses and worked on the farm and uh, worked in the family business. So all of a sudden one day when I was about like, and I and I loved my father dearly. I, you know, everywhere he went, everywhere I used to say he had ridges in the back of my back because of sleeping in the bottom of a boat because everywhere my dad went, I went. When he went fishing, I went. When he went hunting, I went. But when I got to be 13 years old, all of a sudden he made me stop wearing his T-shirts because Mom said he couldn't wash the bumps out of them any longer. <laughs> and that was a shock to me to find out that I, uh, that I, you know, all of a sudden I wasn't his little boy anymore. But it went from that until I was in high school, and I was always, always, you know, the guy's buddy. You know, they'd go play poker, come by, pick me up, and say. And they'd all be sitting around drinking beer and everything, and they'd say, don't let Ellie drink, she's got to drive. She's got to drive the car, she's got to drive us home. And it was always the guys that would come over, and I would think, you know, maybe they'd ask me out or something, and they'd say, hey, really, you know, tell me about this gal, you know, some gal I was running around with. So I was always the guys' buddies, and the girls, I didn't, never have really particularly cared for women, I don't know why. Just years old, and, and all of a sudden this guy came into my life, and and he was 10 years older than I was, and my dad says, oh, he'd be really good for you, you know. He'd, he'd square you away. He'd get that some of that stubborn streak out of you and, and that Irish temper of yours, and you'd be really squared away with this guy. So I got married to him. Well, he drank, and I didn't. I, I hadn't drank hardly anything. I think maybe had a couple of beers and all, all that time. And I, they used to pour a whiskey in a glass, swish it around, pour the whiskey back out, put in coke and ice, and that's the way I drank. And I, for as long as I was married to him, which didn't last too long, because he was more stubborn than I was, and I was spoiled, and he drank, and I didn't like him, and so I just picked up my clothes one day, and I left. I moved here to Portland, and I lived here for a while, and, and I learned that um, leaving a little bit of whiskey in that glass was a hell of a lot more fun than just swishing it around. But I really didn't have a problem with it. I just drank a lot. I never really had a problem with it. And then I met a fellow, moved back to Salem from where I was, and met another fellow and, and who I'd gone to school with and got married. And in 27 months, I had three children. Well, I found out that I was a woman. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, I got three little kids, and I've got a hard-working husband that was, you know, very dependable, extremely dependable. Um, he had a difficult time coping with my Irish temper, and he had a worse time coping with my German math. But he lived through it, you know. He just seemed to, um, but I had three kids and responsibility and decided that no matter what, I was going to make this marriage work. I was raised in a Catholic home, went to 14 years of Catholic school, and that is kind of ingrained in you, and you just don't forget those things. So I worked hard, and I had these three little kids, and I found out, though, that at ironing at 2 o'clock in the morning, and that's before wash and wear and drip dry and all the rest of that jazz, that, that if I had a few drinks, then I could go a little longer, because it'd be time for one of them to wake up and eat, you know. It just seemed like that was the course of events always anyway. And that's really primarily where my drinking started. It was my uh, my buffer. It was my fuel that I needed in order to keep going. And I took in washing and ironing and things in order to pay the bills of the expense of three little kids and so on. But all of a sudden, I guess I just felt as though that um, this was a lot of bullshit. I... Uh, I got tired of being dependable. I got tired of all of the, the responsibilities, I guess, and uh, and my drinking had progressed. And not only was the nighttime a good place to drink, time to drink, but so was the daytime. And I had gotten a part-time job to help fill in on on the income. Well, I got a job as a waitress, and and um, I didn't know a doggone thing about it, and. The people who had Chinese food spilled in their lap also found out I didn't know anything about it. And But I found out that in this place that, that where I worked, they had a bar. And I could get off work at 9 o'clock in the evening, and the kids were well taken care of by their father, and I'd sit down and have three or four drinks. 
And people were laughing there, you know. People were having a good time. They weren't having to rush home and, and make formula and change diapers and listen to a husband and so on and so forth. So the two or three and four drinks progressed on. And then I decided, well, if I'm going to work here, and then my boss had <laughs> long decided before me that I was a rotten waitress, but I could I could learn how to serve cocktails. And that I seemed to be able to really pick up on, you know. I could really sling them. That was, that was good fun. And the people were having fun, and they were dancing and laughing, and good bands were there, and, and it was a big place. And, uh, and I enjoyed myself. So that's what, that's how primarily it all really started, is just, uh, going from one thing to the next. And, um, so I became a cocktail waitress. Um, the fights got more at home, and I really couldn't understand it because I was bringing home good money, you know. What the hell are you bitching about? I'm, I'm helping supplement the income, and I'm working, and you think it's all that easy putting it up with a bunch of drunks all night long. And uh, so after I would get off work, it was a little longer, you know. Each time it seemed like that, I don't know, the sun came up quicker every time. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I just didn't, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> every time I walk out the door, it was a little brighter out there. And um, my husband then decided he was going to pack up and leave. I said, good, I can get along without you, that's okay. And so I hired some people to take care of my children, and um, serving cocktails wasn't all that bad, but I decided I wanted to be a bartender. Because that's where the bucks were. That's that's where I could really have fun, and and um, I didn't have to walk my legs off quite so bad. So I became a bartender, and by that time, I was drinking more and more, um, and uh, started attending bar. And found out that that you could drink while working. That was kind of a revelation to me. And so this glow that I started fueling up the night before continued on. Um, on my nights off, that's where I went, you know, to bars, because everybody knew everybody, and, and, you know, that's what you did. That's just the way you did. I never knew that I had a problem. I did not know that I drank alcoholically, because everybody that I drank with drank the same way I did. You know, so you don't really think about it. Anybody who drinks less than you do, they're, well, they, you know, they're not a whole hell of a lot of fun, so you don't stare about them. You just, you know, cruise off someplace else and find somebody else who drinks the same way you do. So I, um, and my husband, he was, you know, they say hey, the door swings both ways. Well, on our house it did too. He was in and out, you know. He'd pack his clothes and leave for six months and the bills would get bad and, you know, things were coming down and everything. And so he'd come back home. And he'd stay there, and I'd straighten up. I, I really would. I'd really try, because I knew that, that you know, this is this was the right way to do things. This was the the correct way of doing things. And then my father passed away, and then that seemed like all hell broke loose then. And uh, so he would be there for a while and, and putting everything back together, and I'd be trying, and I wouldn't drink, and God damn it, it was hard. And uh, I would go home after work, not drink, not stop, not do anything, and everybody would say, oh, well, you missed a really good party last night. And I said, that's okay for you people, but I've got responsibilities, and i got a home and kids and everything. And so uh, I'd tie one on. You know, i try so hard. i try so hard for six, eight months and almost make it, and I don't know what happened. You know, I was always putting that damn plug in the jug. My problem was is that I kept taking it out, you know. And someone said one time that, hell, it's not hard to quit. I've tried it a thousand times. And that's just, <laughs> that's just about the way I did. I tried so hard. And, and uh, so back off he'd go again. And this went on for 10 years, back and forth. You know, I, he, he used to have a permanent thing with Hertz Rent-A-Trailer that he would just, you know, like a little ticket. He'd have it stamped, you know. <laughs> well, here he comes every six months, Hertz Rent-A-Trailer. So... Um, so I was in a really, in 
This one morning I woke up and he got into the silent part. Now, that, now I can't stand people who are silent, you know. I mean, if you're going to be mad, be God damn it, tell me you're mad. Of course, what he was telling me is the same thing I'd heard my day many Christmas for years. I'd heard the same thing. Ellie, you're drinking too much. Ellie, don't you know your responsibilities? Do you know? If you loved me, you wouldn't do this to me. All that, you know. And I know, you know. I'd heard it. Jesus Christ, I didn't. So, one morning... I thought, well, I'll get you. Not that I'm vindictive, of course. I don't want you to let you, lead you astray here. But I said, all right, you think I have a drinking problem? God damn it, I'll call AA then. I'll do something about it. And I thought, he'd say, oh, God, you're not that bad. <laughs> you know? Well, he didn't say anything. And uh, <laughs> there I was <laughs> on one foot because the other one was in my mouth. And so I called up AA. And this guy says, yeah, yeah, I suppose I can find someone to talk to you, you know. I says, well, I'm okay right now. I said, you know, if you can't, that's okay. I'll call back later. And, um, but I gave him the same mistake of giving him my phone number. So this woman called. Now, I want to tell you that this woman called, and she was so sickening nice. And I had such a hangover. I didn't want to listen to this. You know, and I said, no, I, that's okay. I said, really, I said, it wasn't really necessarily pertaining to me. It's a friend of mine that's got this problem. <laughs> and she thinks that she's been drinking too much. And I said, you know, and her husband keeps telling her she's drinking too much. And her kids are never happy. And they're always crying and so on and so forth. And so she says, well, dear, I'll tell you, whenever you want to speak to me, you come on out. And I kept telling her, I said, listen, lady, it's not me. It's my friend. And she kept saying, well, you just come on out to my house. Well, I didn't. And um, it took me about two weeks, three weeks, I guess, something like that, because it had progressed to where it wasn't any more like six months. No more periodic. The only thing periodic was a case in my trunk. But uh, so I called her one day. And um, she lived way to hell and gone, way out south, way, way out there. And I was, I I knew, you know, I guess I'd better do something. I, I, you know, extend her the courtesy. She seemed so anxious to talk to me that at least I could do is probably, you know, extend her a little courtesy and brighten up her life and let her talk to me or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got my car and out I went. And between her house and my house, there is uh, 17 bars. <laughs> I counted those suckers, every one of them. And every one of them I wanted to stop. And every one I kept saying, by God, if I get up there and if she starts preaching to me, I'm going to turn tail and out I'll go and I'll make every damn one of those 17 on the way back. Because every one of them I used to drink in anyway, you know, and the bartenders, the cocktail witches along the way. So I got up there, and really, she was pretty nice. It surprised me. She didn't look like an alcoholic. Yeah, I mean, you know, her house was clean. Didn't look like mine. <laughs> and, you know, she she was nicely dressed, and, and uh, she didn't live in your old shacky place or anything else. So uh, I said, well, I don't mean, I don't know if I want to go to a meeting. I said, you know, I'll go out and get drunk once in a while. And... Uh, I said, I'll tell you really what I worry about is that we've been a bartender for so long here in town. I said, what am I going to do if I see somebody I know? And she said, what the hell are you worried about? You know, you've seen them at their worst. Now, why don't you see them at their best? And God, I couldn't do that, you know. I couldn't go in an AA meeting and have someone see me there that, that knew me. For Christ, you know, I was in some leper colony or something. So she said, don't worry about it. You know, the probability of you seeing somebody that you know is very remote. And I said, oh, okay. So she said, there's a gal down the street. And I don't have any more A literature here, but her husband's an A, and I'll call her up and she'll come on down. I said, okay. So we were sitting there talking, and this gal comes in the back door, and in she walks. And it's a gal I'd known for years. <laughs> and her husband used to drink in my bar. And I said, you yes, Sophie, if I drank like you, I'd quit, you know. And I'd throw him, I'd cut him up and throw him out. And it's Chuck C. in Salem, who if you know him. <laughs> but, <laughs> and you big ass, Sophie. 
she and I had kids at the same time in, in delivery, and we're in recovery together in the same rooms together. And we used to we used to sit and we'd, we'd play pinochle, her husband, and Chuck and she and my husband and I, and Chuck and I get drunk, and they'd sit there and look disgusting. And um, <laughs> they were, they were now. So anyway, so she, she, I said, see there? So she said, well, don't worry about it. So I went to my first AA meeting that night. And Chuck then was working in Cottage Grove and drove all the way down to Salem for my first meeting. Um, I stayed in AA for 18 months. And man, you know, I went gung-ho. They say, get in it and not on it because it's hard to fall out of the office. Man, I got in. I was going on 12-step calls when I was drove so I was down there. They waved some rights for me to be treasurer and cha-cha-cha and all the rest of this good shit. And uh, I had it knocked. I had it made. Really did. Um, at home, it wasn't any better. Because when I quit, my husband started drinking. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? You know? Why is this? <laughs> All the time, he kept saying, you got a drinking problem. And I said, my only problem is you. <laughs> and uh, so when I quit, he started in. He said, you go to your AA meetings on Friday night, and I'll go out Saturday night. And so that, that's the way it went. And... Uh, I'd get the kids dressed, and he says, now, did you make sure that they brushed their teeth? Did you make sure that they're wearing this? Did you make sure they're doing this? And I guess what had happened is that I had taken away that responsibility because I was trying to be responsible. I had taken those things away from him that he had done all this time and kept bitching at me about, see. And so 18 months I was in AA, and but I, was, I was what they call a two-stepper. I went from 1 to 12 in one easy motion. Zoom, right to the bottom. Nothing in between, you know. No, 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 don't clutter up my mind with details. I don't want to know about a personal inventory. I don't want to make amends. Jesus Christ, are you kidding? I would have to spend <laughs> days making amends, you know. And it, Okay, and, and it says in there, unless to harm, you know, others. I'm an other, you know, and it would harm me <laughs> gravely. <laughs> To make amends to some people, anybody, really. So, my husband then moved out. Before this 18 months was up, he moved out. I said, God, here I am. I tried so hard. I stay sober, you know, and then you move out. And so I had um, stopped him one day to see a friend of mine that worked at a bar, and um, Donna was talking about meeting somebody beautiful. Here's this great, big, huge, six foot three, 225 pound Irishman standing there. And I thought, God, what a repulsive SOB. And he just came on like gangbusters. And I was, so anyway, I met this guy. And he hung around in bars. And I was going to AA meetings, and I get out of AA meetings, and I go to a bar and sit there and drink Coke and laugh and smile, you know. And, I was so happy. All the time inside, you know, it started in as a slow little kind of um, ache, I guess. And then it built into a thought, and then it built into a resentment, and then it built into a drunk. And not too long a time, I was going to any meetings and then staying till halftime and leaving. Or I was going down there and leaving before the meeting started. And I traded that nice little old metal chair like we've got in Salem for a soft bar stool. When I first went in day, I had not lost a job. I had not lost children. I had not wrecked a car. I had not landed in jail. I had not gone to the hospital. My marriage was in and out, but I was still married. None of the yet had happened to me. None of the yet. And when I left, after 18 months of being sober, gee, many Christmas did they happen. Let, I'm here to tell you. For any of you who might doubt that a little drinky doesn't hurt a fellow, bullshit. <laughs> Don't believe that. It didn't take me too long. I, um, and it just happened one day. I was sitting there having my usual coke telling everybody around me that I had diabetes, and that's not why I was drinking any longer, because, you know, you couldn't tell me you're an alcoholic, for God's sake. And um, I had 
quit being a bartender. I was, you know, we had set up a family business by then, and I was working mm-hmm. there, and uh, and my husband was gone, and I was I was doing it. It was a cement business, and it didn't matter to me. I'd worked hard, and I knew how to do it. And I had some healthy kids, and we worked in this business, and so when the drinking started again after 18 months of being sober, I I think um, I got a part-time job as being a, a bus driver too, school bus driver. <coughs> That's when I got my first DUIL. It's kind of difficult driving school bus when you don't have a license. So I knew a judge in town, and he kept my name out of the paper long enough so they didn't fire me until the end of the school year. But um, hello, I was just sitting there one day, and all of a sudden I had a drink. It's like that. It was just like, shazam. (laughs) There it was. And I was drinking it. And then, like anything else, well, I had one. It's too late, you know. I've had one. I guess I can't go back now. And before I knew it, there was two and three and four. And there was a little bit of control drinking in the beginning. I didn't get in trouble right at the beginning when I went back drinking at all. You know, things were relatively smooth. Um, I had a lot of guilt, awful lot of guilt. But um, it, it was not, it was not all that bad until all of a sudden, before I knew it, I was just thoroughly bombed one day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And I can remember thinking to myself, my God, how did I get so drunk? (laughs) I had not planned it this way. I had not decided that that I was, you know. I tried going back to a couple, three times, walk in there, and just, oh, didn't want that. I didn't know what I wanted. Honestly, didn't. I wanted to drink, and I didn't want to be in trouble, and I wanted to be with people that I liked, and I didn't honestly know what I wanted. So back out I go, and I drink some more. That's when I got my first DUIL ticket, and um, promptly got bailed out of jail. And that was, you know, all too bad. Um, I suppose I was... um, It took about three months, and I got a second DUIL ticket. That time, that time I was really resentful that the police even stopped me, and and, um, in fact, I was so resentful it took five or six of them to get me into jail. (laughs) Well, I figured if I was going, I ain't going to go without a fight. I don't know why it seems like a story of my life. I ain't going to give up easy, and if you're going to get me, you're going to get me good. So, um, <laughs> so I, and I had just, you know, got through paying the fine on one and, and was 90 days suspended. Driving on a suspension, and so the second time they really, they really got me. I say that I don't drink alcohol because I'm allergic to it and I break out in spots like Seattle, Boise, <laughs> Las Vegas. When I came in here, there was one part in the, in the book, big book. It says, uh, "If you want what we have," and I thought, "Hot damn, I'm home again!" You know, because I always wanted what you had. When I was drinking, I wanted your money and your car, and uh, anything else that I could hawk. But when I got here, I wanted what you had. I wanted your your peacefulness. I wanted your love. I wanted your acceptance. And uh, so when I was out there drinking the second time around, I, I wasn't, you know, I was looking for those things and not being able to find any of them. And uh, in two and a half years, I made the gamut. The only thing that I missed was the state hospital, and I drove out there one day and was going to commit myself and fell asleep in the car. <laughs> and by the time I woke up, I was, you know, it didn't feel so bad. And so I said, geez, I don't want to be here. So I started the car and away I went. I um, had a friend that had, um, well, he had kind of a shady business. And um, 
I change license plates on my car a lot in order to be able so the cops wouldn't stop me. I, um, I, my blackouts got to the point to where I had very few actual days that I could, you know, really remember. And, um, in fact, when I sobered up, I wrote the telephone company a letter of saying, thank you very much for putting phone books and phone booths all over the Northwest, because that's the only way. Many times when I knew where I was, I would wake up at a motel, and um, the first thing I'd do is grab a phone book. Afraid to go out, because I didn't know what was out there, you know, and afraid to, <laughs> to open my eyes, because I didn't know who was there. So. <laughs> and this is the way my life went for two and a half years, and... Um, big Irishman I was talking about, he he was in a lot of it. He, um, I always thought, God damn, if I could ever find somebody drunk like I did. Yeah. I mean, that would be fun. My husband, my ex-husband now, would um, have three beers, two, two games of pool, ready to go home, and I'm just getting going. You know, I'm just getting started, and he's ready to go home. So we go home, I slip him a couple sleeping pills in his coffee, and he go to sleep, and I go back out. And... Uh, that's kind of the way, you know, but I finally found someone that could drink like I did, and it was just fantastic, you know, and his capacity was as good, if not better, than mine, and, um, and the way we went, and uh, we covered a lot of territory, we went to a lot of places, a lot of bars, and, and had a lot of fun, I think, <laughs> I'm not sure, um, until um, in April, <laughs> five years ago, um, I had just gotten out of jail again and um, was due to go back on another misdemeanor thing. And uh, and I had gotten out of jail on a Thursday and had decided to go get drunk and had been thoroughly saturated by Saturday, I guess it was Saturday, I, I don't know, and uh, was with my my friend, and uh, we'd had a big argument. It's always my temper, always my temper. If I had never, if I had never gotten mad, I probably would be an Al-Anon. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was always my temper in my mouth that got me the most trouble. So anyway, I um, had was thoroughly bombed, and uh, And I, this was like about like 12 o'clock at night, I guess. And, and I was in a section of Salem. I don't know why I was there. I have no idea. And I was on a street. I don't know anybody that lives on that street. And I had gone around a corner, and I'd hit a parked car. And I cracked a couple of ribs on the steering wheel and broke up my mouth and everything. And it brought me out of my blackout long enough for me to realize... Oh, you better get back there, because you're in a whole bunch of trouble. So I went around what seemed like 20 miles and then got back, and the cops were there, and the lights were flashing. I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> Here I go. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just go to jail. And uh, I got out of the car, and, and and I saw somebody that I recognized, and, and I said, oh, I said, God, I know you. He says, you're damn right you do, and it was my car you hit. Well, that car I hit on that street, I don't know why I was there, in a section of town, I have no idea why I was there, was an AA member's car. And I had not been in AA for two and a half years. And that was Easter Sunday morning, April 22nd, five years ago. And uh, my last drink. Today. So I decided that... Um, Back to jail I went, you know, <laughs> and this time, boy, they were going to throw the book at me, and I had uh, had three DUILs, I don't know how many suspended. Gave a cop one time my library card, and he says, well, now that we know how you know how to read, let's see if you know how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, um. I went back to, I was, I was going to skip town. I was going to go to Mexico. My uncle lives in Mexico in the winter and lives up here in the summer. And, and I was going to go down there. And, and um, 
my friend decided that he says, you better not. He says, why don't go back to Haiti? He said, you were doing good there. Uh, so I said, well, I don't know. So we're the detox center now in Salem. We used to be Media Via. And I stopped in there at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'd just gotten out of jail again. And um, I stopped in there, and Stuart Green, you know him, was running at then, and God, he gave me orange juice and honey, and talked to me and kept saying, you know, what are you going to run from? The Jew. There is your problem. Can't run from things. You're going to take it with you. I guess I never really knew that. I suppose I'd heard it someplace, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it was one of those things that didn't want to register up here. So I said, okay, I'll give it one day. One day, that's all I'll give it. And I came back in this program one day. And I did it for one day. I did it for five minutes. I had um, gone through DTs two or three times before in the two and a half years, and I felt that I was starting through them again, and so I, they gave me a couple shots to get me over that. They pumped me full of orange juice and honey and a lot of vitamins, and they kept saying, you've got to go to meetings, Ellie. You've got to go to meetings. And I said, I don't want to go to those spring meetings. You've got to go to meetings. One day, that's what I said I'd give it. And in those one days, I've had a lot of rewards. Um, I married that big friend of mine, and he's still out there. He's beating his head against the wall. He's drinking the same as what he drank when we were going together. And that's okay. You know, that's his problem. I, I'm a lucky person. I have two programs. When I get really squirrely, really sick, I go down on them. <laughs> 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 Right. I'll tell you, those people, you know, my program keeps me thinking and straight, and those people keep me together. I don't know what I would do without either one of them, you know, because I have double benefits from both. I work on my problem, and I let him work on his. And so long as his doesn't become mine, we're fine. If his becomes mine, we're gone. There's one thing in this in in the twelve by twelve for the lady who had, who had won it. There's rule sixty two on a page one hundred and fifty three, and that's what I live by. I think of that constantly because if I don't, I'm on a hell of a lot of trouble. Go home and look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred and fifty three rule sixty two. It's a good rule. It's it's the way to live. Um, I enjoy this program immensely. I am a firm believer if I do not if I forget my past I'm doomed to relive it. If I forget my last drunk, I'm gonna go right back out there and live it over again, only it's gonna be so much worse for me. I uh I have a lot of friends, and you are my family. I have uh, I have no other real family but you. I don't care to really associate with anybody else but AA people. And I enjoy this time of year immensely. And for any of you who are out there that have Christmas parties to go to, stay the hell away from them. <laughs> I don't know why it is they have to get drunk and booze it up at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I can remember one Thanksgiving when my kids were very small and they had hot dogs to eat for Thanksgiving because Mom didn't come home and fix the turkey. One Christmas they didn't have any presents because Mom wasn't there to give them to them. This is a time of gratitude for me, and this whole pro program for me is gratitude. Now, God grant me the serenity. And in a grant, I have to work what it is that's given to me. And with him giving me this serenity, I have to attain ways of life and people around me and my attitude. That's what AA is, attitude adjustment. In order for me to adjust my attitudes, to be able to work out there and to live out there with a hostile environment, for me, it's a hostile environment. 
When I was out there, I was fighting. I come here, I don't fight anymore. My attitudes today are to such that I can live with me. In here where I live, I am comfortable. I don't have to beat my head against the wall. I don't have to compete any longer. I can have a life today that that is as good as I'll let it be. And whenever I get a few resentments filled up, I don't let them eat on me any longer. You know? And I'd heard it said one time that resentments is self-pity turn inward. And I really believe that. Whenever I start feeling sorry for Ellen, when I think things aren't going my way, no, not today any longer do I have to beat my head against the wall. And in coming into this program, I made a lot of discoveries. I discovered one day that if I don't drink, I don't get drunk. Isn't that fantastic? That never occurred to me before. If you don't drink, you don't get drunk. Sure, someone around somewhere is, you know, saying, I I thought of that. <laughs> I never thought of that. In coming to this program, I discovered after a few months that I wasn't getting in any more trouble. And then after about a year, I discovered that I was a little bit comfortable. Not a whole hell of a lot now, don't you know? <laughs> I don't want you to take any wild ideas, but a little bit comfortable. <coughs> I discovered uh, after a few more years that, that you people were on my side, that I no longer had to fight anybody any longer, that things were happening in my life because I was leading a life to where things now can happen. <laughs> There's also in one of our books, I don't know exactly where it is. Oh, I read so many of them. But it says if you want to pray for potatoes, you better be willing to pick up a hoe. If you want sobriety, you have to work for it. If you want good things to happen in your life, you have to work for them. Nothing was ever just given to us. And it's a, you know, it's a good thing. If things were just have handed to me when I walked in this room, I would say, I want more. <laughs> Never happy with the fifth, I want two. <laughs> things happen because we work for them. And each and every one of you here tonight, you know, where in the hell would a bunch of alcoholics be? Now, this is not normal for alcoholics to be on a Saturday night. Jeez, you know, I can think, boy, when I was, you think I'd catch, and catch me in a room with a bunch of people drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes? Baloney, uh-uh. You know, you got to get out there and be someone. <laughs> Whoa. No. You know, and I choose to go to AA meetings. I go to a lot of them, and I, and I enjoy, and there are, I have never been to a bad AA meeting. And after tonight, I hope you feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to a bad aim. It's only how I take it. It's only how I'm receiving it at the time. And every time whenever I'm down and I'm tired and I don't really want to go is when I go. And I walk out of there, I'm still tired, but I feel good. Someone has said something. You know? The charisma of the group, the charisma of you people is astounding to me. Every day it's astounding to me. How whenever you took me and I didn't want me, and you loved me and I didn't love me, and you gave me a will to live, and I didn't want to live. I was going to kill myself the most sociably acceptable way I knew how, and I was going to drink myself to death. I had tried suicide. I was always afraid I was going to get myself maimed. You know, marked up, and if I didn't die, then I'd hear I'd be walking around with this ugly scar on me or something. You know. Went out one time and I bought a dress. Because I was going to kill myself. <laughs> well, you don't want to look tatty laying in a coffin, you know. So I bought this dress, and I had a white collar on, it had kind of a v neck, you know, and I thought, well, now that looks kind of nice. 
still. <laughs> kind, of, kind of, you know, PTA look. <laughs> Basic, nice PTA look. So I, I tried it on. Yeah, it looked pretty good. And I had decided that I was going to... I had heard someone say, that, you know, with the old holes and the rags and the car and the gastric and so I went out way out in the country, way up at Silver Creek Falls. And I used to go up there and drink a lot. And uh, I got the holes out, got the rags out, got everything out, you know, and started the car. I'm, and I turned up the radio real loud, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm singing and I'm smoking and I'm thinking, nothing's happening. What's happening? Nothing's happening. And I got out of the car. And the hose had slipped out of the exhaust, you know. And about that time, it started to rain, and it got my hair wet. And I thought, I don't think I want to do this. <laughs> you know. So I got back in the car and went back to sail. Well, now I had this dress, this PTA dress, right? And it had this white collar. Well, I ripped the white collar off of it, and I put some jewelry on. Hell, it didn't look too bad to go out. And I wore it out several times, and I used to say, this is my coffin dress, and no one really knew what I was talking about. <laughs> But I wasn't insane, I want to tell you that, right? <laughs> there was no insanity in my house. I came in here and I said that I was powerless over alcohol and my husband was unmanageable. <laughs> and he was thoroughly unmanageable. I was unmanageable. My life today I would not trade for my best day bunk. My best day. And I had a hell of a lot of fun in the beginning of drinking. A lot of fun. But I cannot think of one memory that I'd ever want back. There are so many that A has given me that I, you know, and I kind of get on blackouts with AA memories, if that makes any sense. I traded those two and a half sips of scotch a day for about two and a half gallons of coffee. <laughs> I smoke now more than what I ever smoked before. You people have given me so much. And I've heard it said that AA is the language of the heart. And it really is. You make my life worthwhile. Thank you for being here when I need you. Hi, I'm Donna. Woo, this echoes back. <laughs> I'm a grateful member of Al Anon. Okay. So I don't confuse you, I'm also a member of NA and AA. <laughs> Just before I came up here, Ann handed me a note and says, I used to be sick, I went to Alna and I went to NA and I went to AA. I'm still sick, but I'm, but I'm better now. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I have something I'll read to you, and I'll kind of tell you how this kind of all got started, if, if God will allow me to. He's going to have to talk to him because I don't belong up here. I just never learned to say no. <laughs> In every heart, affection grows like a tiny seed reaching for the sun, growing because it has to grow once it has begun. That's kind of what al did for me, and I could stop right now and say that's what's happening. <laughs> but I'll try to tell you what it was like and what happened and what it's like today. I was sick. I would like to say that my alcoholic made me sick. <laughs> and I even thought that for a long time. But um, he can't hear me. <laughs> I don't know if I can talk any louder. Um, I was sick a long time. Maybe I could, should move these down. Okay, thank you. I was sick a long time before I ever got to um, Al-Anon or before I was ever involved with an alcoholic. I remember when I was young, very young, um, my parents fought a lot. And then one day I just started screaming. And they were just, what's the matter? <laughs> you know? I said, I just want you to quit fighting. And I went from that to, um, I attempted suicide at a very young age, except I guess I wasn't too serious because after I did it, I told my parents, I remember the rush to the hospital and all the, all the fun that was in the hospital. Um, I left home at an early age. I was already involved in drinking myself, and I was already involved 
with alcoholic people. I've never had a relationship with a normal person or whatever a normal person is. I've never had a relationship with anyone who hasn't been an alcoholic or a drug addict or at least involved in drugs or alcohol in some way or another. And so I drank for many years. I made it through high school by the grace of God. I went to California and lived for a while. And um, I quit drinking then for a while because I was supporting myself. And at 16, living in California, that's, that's heavy enough. And so I, I pretty much kept myself together. I remember one day my boyfriend um, came down to my job. And he was going to walk me home. And he would stay with me for the weekend. And um, he says, guess what I have in my bag? And I go, slush, slush. And I thought, huh. <laughs> you know? And I remember being afraid because I knew he had alcohol. And um, I could remember some of the trouble that alcohol had gotten me into. Some of the trips that I'd had to lie about. Many trips I had to lie about. I always had to lie because I was always drinking. I was always in trouble. So I didn't really drink a whole lot then. But I remember being scared of it. I remember be being scared of of the bottle. And I got out of that relationship. We were going to be married. And um, I got ch I chickened out. And fortunately, I just didn't get pregnant back then. And it was a little while later that I got pregnant. And back in those days, there was no questions asked. You just got married. So I remember my mother packing my suitcase. And so I don't remember which number of alcoholic I was on then, but this was my first marriage. And I didn't relate to him being alcoholic. I just thought he liked to hang out in the bars. He was a veteran from Vietnam and was blind, so he didn't have much else to do except go to school and hang out in the bars, and so I thought that was okay. Um, I found a reason to divorce him. Or he, no, he divorced me. <laughs> he sued me for a divorce, thinking it would scare me and I'd come running back. Well, I was never, never afraid of anything because I didn't have enough sense to be afraid of anything. I got involved in drugs again then. And I got into my own habit later on. I finally got into street drugs after I'd been into drugs. Um, I'd gotten into speed. The first time I did speed was from a doctor. I had anemia really bad. I complained because I didn't feel well, so he gave me some speed. I felt real well. <laughs> Got a lot done. I just felt real well. <laughs> and then I started complaining because I couldn't sleep, so he gave me downers. And... Um, I lost another, ch I lost, I got pregnant and lost the child shortly after it was born due to drugs. And I remember playing all these, all the deaths I played through very morbidly. I remember, I was real detached at first, but then years later I was still taking flowers out to graves. I was just real crazy all through, from as long as I can remember, I have been crazy and not been able to deal with life. So I got into um, I got into drugs, pretty heavy. I started growing pot out. I moved out to my parents' farm. My parents um, had some land, so I bought a trailer house and moved to some of their land and started growing pot. And um, one day they came to dust the fields. And I said, "Now don't let them dust my land." <laughs> Whatever you do, don't let them, don't let them dust my flowers. <laughs> well, the, some of the dust, the wind was blowing. The wind always blows back in Idaho. The wind blew some of the dust over some of my flowers, and I was really disturbed because I went out and my little flowers' heads were curling over. So I was upset because of that. Went out and washed them all off. A friend came by, and so we washed all of the flowers down. And. Uh, Eventually, some of my dad's friends started recognizing these pretty little plants that are getting about six feet tall all of a sudden, <laughs> bushy all over. <laughs> so my dad's friend says, I think your daughter's growing marijuana. <laughs> I 
And so, you know, so my dad was very upset. He called me at my job and said I'd better come home because I was in trouble. And it's just been the last few years I realized how much trouble I was in. My dad was also friends with the police, and so they just came out and, and helped me burn my crop. <laughs> <laughs> my friends went by it would say later, say, you know, one day we were driving out here and it smelled like pot all over. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was my crop. <laughs> felt very bad. I went back to work and people said, what kind of cologne are you wearing? <laughs> Fresh pot, you know. <laughs> so I was asked to leave the state. <laughs> so they escorted me to the state line. I traveled around for about a year then with my son, who by then was about four or so. I was crazy enough that I let him um, smoke pot. He did a few other things that were pretty heavy. <laughs> And he lived a pretty wild life right along with his mother. We traveled and slept in parks and the whole trip. And um, we finally ended up up here in Oregon. I came up here, and I, before I had even gotten up here, I'd gotten into hard drugs down in Nevada. I'd start fixing myself. I don't know how long that lasted. It lasted quite a while. I would send my son to Idaho quite a bit then because I wasn't able to do that and take good care of him, and I knew it. I tried to hide it. I remember once he found, he came in, and um, he says, Mom, he says, is somebody sick? And I says, no. I says, why? And he says, well, I found this thing that you give shots with. And then <laughs> I felt pretty sick then, but I still didn't relate to being sick. I still thought... I was just having fun. I was just having a good time. <laughs> when I think back about that now, hanging out over in the ghetto, <laughs> down where um, Mississippi and, Al and Albina split, it was when I was fairly new in town. And I didn't realize they split, and we were we were looking for um, Desats and Dan. <laughs> Dizoxin is a drug that he, they give for sleeping sickness, and poor Dan had sleeping sickness. <laughs> so we would go over and take some of our pot that we were growing and trade Dan pot for Dizoxin and fix it up. And we were looking for his apartment, and we didn't know the, the street split. So we were down on Mississippi, and we were supposed to be over in Albina, and the only place we could find was this abandoned par apartment where some of my kind of people had been but they had deserted the place. I had signs all along the way like that, you know, looking into abandoned places, seeing that people couldn't handle that kind of lifestyle. But I still stayed in it. I still stayed there for quite a while after that. I finally didn't know how to get away from that. I thought, well, I would move some of my friends owned land in Southern Oregon. So I was going to try a geographical relocation. And I did to get off of hard drugs. And I, I went through withdrawal all by myself. And I moved down to Southern Oregon and um, got clean of hard drugs. But just before I had left, I had met this beautiful man. And I thought he was just it. You know, he was intelligent, gorgeous. <laughs> so I asked him if he'd like to come down and visit me. He said, yeah. So he quit his job, and he came down and visited me. Well, I didn't really mean for him to stay, and I don't think he really knew what he was going to do either, but he ended up staying. And um, one day he got drunk. We went to a party. It was out in the country, and you all walked to all the parties. And he disappeared, and that's okay. You know, he knows his way home, and I know my way home, so when I get bored, I'll go home, and whenever he gets bored, I guess he'll go home. Well, I got home, and he'd been um, sick, and he'd vomited all over. And I tried to wake him up, and then he was sleeping very sound. <laughs> 
So I just left him, and my son and I slept downstairs that night. I made beds downstairs for us. And in the morning, he was angry because I'd let him sleep in this huge mess. I said, well, I tried to wake you up. I couldn't want to wake you up. You just, you just slept. <laughs> and it was strange, though. You know, it was, it was just strange. And um, I didn't understand it, but I justified it. And he says, he told me then, he says, I'm an alcoholic. I says, oh, no, you just had an accident. You just got drunk. You know, that's okay. So he got sick then, and um, his lung collapsed, and we spent some time in the hospital. Not we, he did, but we did. <laughs> I remember driving 50 miles a day <laughs> up and 50 miles back to take him to the hospital. And he was very sick, and he's lucky he lived. And we spent a lot of time there, though, and it, it gave us 10 days to think about some things. We decided we'd like to... Um, Moved back to the city. So we moved back to the city, and um, we got back to the city, and things just kind of instantly started going kind of crazy. Not kind of crazy, pretty crazy. And we got back, and I remember the first thing he did is go down to the liquor store and buy a bottle. And that was kind of scary again, you know. It was just kind of scary because I remembered the times when I used to get really drunk and used to drink hard liquor and... Back in Idaho, we lived by the Hell's Canyon, and it's still nothing even to this day for a few of us young people to just get too drunk, and we just don't know where we're at, and we just drive right over the canyon. It's all she wrote for us, and we do it about six in the car, because we always have the car full, you know. Why take more than one car when you're out driving around drinking? And I remember once when we got out of the car, and we were just about three or four feet from the canyon, and those things didn't even phase me then. But they phase me now, and I know that I'm lucky to be here. I know that a power greater than me got me here. So, we'll go back to the city now. <laughs> and um, we were still living together. We came and got an apartment, and um, I went to work, and I left my son alone all day, who was six now. I think he was six. He was either five or six. He was too young to be left alone, but I didn't know what else to do because I didn't know many people here except back in my old neighborhood where I knew I could get into trouble. So I went to work and I left my son. And I just kind of took it for granted that this man um, would kind of halfway watch out for him. He was going to stay home and read the paper and look for a job himself. I remember coming home from work one day, and I could hear this terrible, terrible screaming from the bus stop. And I thought, someone must be dying. And the closer I got to my apartment, the closer I thought, I think that's my child. The closer I got to my apartment, it was my child. I don't know what my son had done, even to this day. Whatever he did, he didn't deserve what he got. And this man had beat him. He had marks on him. And when I bathed him, I saw these ugly marks on him. So I told this man, if you do this again, I will have to leave. I don't really remember how many times it happened. Things just kind of proceeded to get worse gradually, but sometimes I would think they were getting better. I just, I, I was keeping notes back then, I remember. I remember I quit keeping notes because I couldn't handle the notes anymore. And eventually it started being me that was being shoved around and it wasn't my son anymore. And I thought, well, that's okay. I would rather it be me than my son. So I justified that. I left several times, always to return. I never knew why I was returning, but I always returned. One of my girlfriend's mothers, who I'm very close to, she was talking to her mother one day, and her mother said she had told her mother that I was having trouble. Well, her mother had known me since I was a very small girl, and she said, well, I think you should tell Donna she should go to an Al-Anon meeting. So Joanne says, Donna, Mom says you should go to an Al-Anon meeting. <laughs> so I says, okay. 
and I waited several months until I had finally had the shit beat out of me real good this time. I was in the hospital, and they... I thought, surely they wouldn't let me go back home with him. Surely they would do something. Surely they could see something. Well, they fixed me up with Valium, gave me a few shots of Valium, and all I wanted to do was just give me some more Valium. <laughs> just give me another shot, and then maybe I won't give a fuck, you know. <laughs> they sent me back home. Just sure enough. I was so disgusted that I had a friend, a friend of mine and myself took the stitches out myself. Because I was disgusted with them because they wouldn't do anything. I never stopped to think that I was so scared that I couldn't say anything. An officer came up to me in the hospital and he says, Would you like to talk to me? And I just wouldn't say anything. I just laid there. Just hoping they could read my mind and do something or do something, you know. Somebody do something. I didn't know how I got myself in this place. I didn't know why I loved this person. I don't know, even to this day, how it got so crazy and why it was so crazy, but it was crazy. So I went to my first Al-Anon meeting, and I thought I was pretty cool. But there ain't nothing wrong with me. You know, I'm pretty cool. And um, it was pretty neat, though, and I said, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll keep coming. <laughs> and I kept coming. And... Um, I started getting better, but I didn't even know that I was getting better. I even thought that my alcoholic was getting better. <laughs> and God knows he hadn't done nothing except drink more. <laughs> but I had gotten better enough that um, life was bearable. I learned a lot of weird things that seem weird to a lot of people, but they're not weird to me. I learned that if I didn't fight back, I didn't get beat. I learned that if he knocked me down and I didn't jump back up and say, you son of a bitch, you're not going to push me around, that I didn't get pushed around because I laid there the first time until he was out of sight. I learned that I wasn't alone anymore. These people says, call me. You know, they'd talk to me any other time of day. They would talk to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was never crazy at my house during the daylight hours. You know, it was, it was always just normal, just every day. Everybody thought we were normal. To this day, all those neighbors back there think it's still normal. <laughs> a lot of them are living in it themselves. Most of them are living in it themselves. So they think it's normal. It's normal to them. It's not normal to me anymore. And even my mother-in-law says it's normal. One day she said, I said that we were talking, and I said, well, that we were having some problems. And she says, well, you know, what's your problems? And I says, well, Nathaniel just insists upon settling things physically, and I'm just not big enough to physically settle disagreements. She says, oh, well, that's just part of being married. You know? And I thought, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I thought, well, that's how my parents' marriage was, and I decided that wasn't going to be part of my marriage. That, that's not the way I wanted things to be. So I, I kept thinking that maybe he'd get better. I kept getting better. Eventually, um, I left. Just a week before I left, though, I went to an al meeting, and I said, I love this man dearly, that I knew he was going to drink till the day he died, but I was going to stay with him. <laughs> a week later, I was gone. <laughs> he got crazy again. By then, I had another baby, a little tiny baby, and um, I had gone traveling with my parents, and when I got back, we always had this adjusting period to go through because he always stayed pretty drunk when I was away. And every night when I got home, he was really angry about something. One night, my baby had made one of these gigantic messes from... If anybody has babies, you know what kind of messes babies make. Okay. Uh, only that they're beyond help. All you do is you take all their clothes off of them and you put them in the bathroom. Okay, I had the baby laying on the floor, and I was going to give her a bath, and he came in, and he didn't want his baby laying on the bathroom floor. Well, there wasn't any place else to lay the baby. <laughs> this was an old house that didn't have a vanity or anything. <laughs> so he was angry, and um, the next night he came home, and I had some rings on that he didn't like. 
and he was just angry enough this time to start pushing me around. But like I say, I learned not to get hurt anymore. So then he took the baby, and he, so he locked. He was going to put her in her bed because he didn't want this terrible woman touching his baby. So I think this was about the second time he'd been to jail then. So I called the police, and the police came to get him. And I remembered what the first time was like when he got out of jail. And so I stayed with the neighbors, and he was right back out of jail. The first time he was in jail, I had nothing to do with, and I don't even know why he was in jail to this day. Those things were none of my business. <laughs> but I remembered what it was like, and I stayed with the neighbors. And um, they were going to get me into some into a communal home with their religion, and they would take care of me and set me on my way. I stayed with them for a few days, and I says, but first of all, I'm going to go to my Al-Anon meeting. And they, this woman really fought this. You know, She wanted me to get into this communal home where these people were going to take care of me, and I was going to learn to love God and Jesus, and I was going to be okay. <laughs> well, so she even went to my Al-Anon meeting with me. And I told everybody at my Al-Anon meeting what had happened. And as usual, all of my Al-Anon friends were supportive and came up and gave me all their loving care and support. And I didn't move into the communal home and get all straightened out. <laughs> but she was amazed. She says, I never saw anything like that. She says, I never saw so many caring people. And I just says, yeah, you know, I already knew. I knew that I had those people. I never had anything like that before. Al-Anon is my family. I got crazier over someone else's drinking than I did my own. Even when I was using hard drugs, I was crazier over someone else's drinking. When my husband was drunk, I'd be, I was sure, and I told him so. He would come in, I'd say, you're drunk. I suppose I probably asked to be hit a lot of times. If someone talked to me that way, I'd probably belt them in the mouth, too. So, I'm out of that one. Well, I'm not really out of that one. <laughs> we bought a lot of property together. Out of my dishonest ways, just because I, w I didn't ha I have never had any scruples to live by. Let's just take a moral inventory. Someone finally told me it's not an immoral inventory. <laughs> they must have known the life I'd led. <laughs> we bought property, and we said we were married so we could put it on the GI Bill. And that's still... I'm still trying to go through that, and I still don't have the sense... I heard someone say at a meeting the other night that they had that they had things to be thankful for and that not having a lawyer was one of those things. <laughs> and I laugh because I've got a lawyer and I wish I didn't have I mean, I'm glad I've got one. <laughs> but I wish I didn't have to have one. I have all of my affairs in such a mess that there isn't anybody except God himself who's ever going to be able to straighten them out. They're taking a long time to straighten out. I haven't lived with this man for over a year and some odd months. Several odd months. <laughs> and it's still a long ways from being settled. You know, I, I think God's having a rough time with it himself to tell you the truth. <laughs> so I carried on in my little program of Al-Anon. And I got to this certain point where I was just still crazy. And um, I didn't really know what was the matter. I went to a, my group saw a fit <laughs> for me to be their group representative. And back when I was, when they nominated me and stuff, there weren't a whole lot of us to be group group, rep, group representative. So I got to go to all the little conferences and stuff, which I dearly loved. I thought I should be paying them to get to go, and I still think that's true. I, if you haven't been to a conference, you're missing out. 
is all I got to say about that. But one of them I went to in Klamath Falls. I don't know why. I started talking about drugs. And the people I was with wasn't really into them that much. I know it was me. I'd been trying to work on my inventory, and I could not complete my inventory. I couldn't get any place. I just was stuck. I just, I was just still going to meetings, and that's just where I was. I spent a terrible night in that hotel. I woke up in the morning, and I felt like I wanted another fix. I thought, this is crazy. But that was how I felt. I thought, well, I'm just going to put this out of my mind. Just going to make it go away. Well, it didn't go away. It kind of hung around in my mind all day. All through the conference, as a matter of fact. So I went home after the conference, and I thought, well... So I started smoking some pot with some friends, and that wasn't enough. So I smoked some more pot, and that wasn't enough. I called someone, and they says, maybe you should go to an N.A. meeting, Donna. And I says, but I haven't done anything like that for years. <laughs> the only thing I do is smoke pot, <laughs> take pills occasionally. <laughs> So I, anyway, so I went to my first N.A. meeting, and I ached as bad as I had way back those years when I had been using hard drugs. My arms even ached, and I hadn't even stuck a needle in them. I just hurt that bad. And they asked me some questions, and I says, no. Did I ever spend my rent money? No. Did I spend my grocery money? No. Did I ever miss work? Oh, no. I was there because I used to m meet my pusher man at lunch hour. <laughs> I was always at work. I said no to all the questions, and I went home and had a terrible night that night, too. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all that night. <laughs> Every time I tried to sleep, one of these little questions that go to my mind say, Oh, I did do that. The answer is yes to that. <laughs> it's yes to that, too. So... I stayed in N.A. I really didn't relate to alcohol then either. You know, I, I finally got to the point where I could say I was an addict. And that was hard, too. I didn't want to be an addict. I'd get up in the middle of the night sometimes and say, I don't want to be an addict. And I'd cry, say, I don't want to be an addict. And I didn't know enough people to call then, and so I just kind of cold turkey did through that. Then <laughs> finally I remembered that I had been drinking, too, that I had drank from a very early age. I, when I got sick enough that I couldn't handle it, I would quit for a while. It always got worse. When that wasn't enough, I started mixing it with pills. When that wasn't enough, I went to hard drugs. I don't know what would have been enough. I'm only glad that I got to this program. I needed every Al-Anon meeting I ever had before I could have gone into N.A. and have survived in N.A. and A.A. Because when you get into N.A. and A.A., they talk about God. And when I got to Al-Anon, I says, I'm an atheist. And they says, well, you can stay anyway. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, I got a higher power. I choose to call him God nowadays. <laughs> he stays real close to me. This program has done things that I could never do. Finally, I'm starting to grow up. As long as I stay in this program and follow the guidelines and the steps, I can't fuck up too much. I can only fuck up for a little while, and then I can't stand it any longer. And I have to get back to my program, and I have to do it. I don't have to worry anymore about using drugs and alcohol because I get sick too fast and I go downhill too fast. But I still have to worry about living. I can talk about, I can joke now about killing myself because I'm not suicidal anymore. Even though life is hard sometimes, I'm here to stay. I love the ups and downs of it. I obviously do. I've been messing around with alcoholics still. I still love them. <laughs> the only thing I know, too, is that in order for me to have a relationship with anyone, I need my al program. 
And not only at this point, not only do I need a program, but I need for them to have a program of their own. I need for them to have a program of living. I'm not the mama I used to be. I can remember always trying to make things right for everybody. I don't do that anymore. I'm so detached, it's almost sickening. <laughs> I don't think enough can be said for this program. I just know that I was really sick. And like Anne says, I'm still sick, but I'm bitter. <laughs> I could have never have been up here in a million years. I don't even believe I'm standing up here with you all now. Except I know that it's okay. I know that I don't have to come up here and perform for you. I'd rather be singing. <laughs> but I don't have that either. I don't have that down. But I can play around with people and work on music as long as I know where they're at. And they can pretend we're going to go to the stage. But I can sing for four and six hours and say, hey, this is fun. I can live just for today, and I can have a good day. I can start my day at any point and turn it around if I really want to. This program can do anything for you that you want to do. You just have to work it. Nobody's going to do it for you. Some of us thought maybe it would if we just let sit down and let things kind of slide by. I've watched myself. I watch myself when I don't go to many meetings. I've watched myself when I don't read literature. I've watched myself when I don't talk to people. And I watch myself go downhill and I go down fast, even without the pro, with, just without the program, even if I don't use any drugs or anything. I get so sick that some of my people say, I didn't even want to talk to you for a while. <laughs> That's just when I forget the program. But I remember this program. The longest I ever go off, I went through my first dry drunk this week. I guess it was a dry drunk. It was a messy time. But I stayed close to people. I talked to people. And today I feel great. And I've had a great day. And even those days were great. They didn't last long. I didn't do anything destructive to myself. My family is so much better. When I went into Al-Anon, my son's grades went up in citizenship. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? <laughs> Whoever is here for their first time, I hope you keep coming. The people that have watched me in this program know I've come a long ways. You may not know I've come a long ways. I know I've come a long ways, and I know there's still a lot of you who wouldn't want, there's probably nobody who'd want to be where I'm at even today. I like being where I'm at today. I've been able to accept things. I always remember I quit using drugs because I didn't want to live in an institution. I ended up in an institution anyway for protective custody. I made it through that, and I grew through that. They started calling me their, um... Their resident therapist or something like that, some bullshit, because I had the program. Because I could just, most of the people in there were there because of drug problems or alcohol problems. And they really thought I was something. My daughter's father kidnapped her. And, um, accused me of child abuse, and so I've been, um, the county psychiatrist has checked me out and analyzed me. Wait till you hear this. I am an intellectually intense controlled woman. No, intense intellectually controlled woman. <laughs> I wasn't that before. You know where Father Martin talks about how the drinker has his intelligence? That's how it's supposed to be, his intelligence over his emotions. And how when you drink, your emotions are over your intelligence. It didn't matter whether I was drinking or whether someone else is drinking. My emotions were always over my intelligence. I didn't act. I reacted. And I reacted to everything. My emotions were always there. I didn't have any intelligence. I didn't even know what intelligence was. I was just one big bundle of emotions just exploding time after time after time. 
I'm not that now. I can act intelligently if I will allow myself to. If I stay with this program, if I talk to lots of people, I can do that. I don't know if the program's given you guys what's given me, but I sure hope so. Because it still has a whole lot more to give me. I'm still young. I didn't say that either. I thought I was so old. They asked me if I'd work on the young people's roundup. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. I've just begun to live. And I thank you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.